Hello everybody. We warmly welcome you to our third international seminar event, the 15th seminar of the Aphasia CRE seminar series. I'm Michelle Attard, co-facilitator of the seminar series. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous Elders past and emerging and pay respects to the traditional custodians of all of the lands in which we meet today. We also acknowledge the difficult time of COVID for everybody around the world. We're particularly thinking of healthcare staff who continue to support individuals and communities during this challenging time. Today, we cross over to Finland from Australia and we're very pleased to have Associate Professor Teppo Safkamo presenting for us. Before the formal introduction, I'll briefly cover some housekeeping. Please be patient with us in the technology today. We apologize in advance if there are some disruptions to your viewing during this seminar. Occasionally, some attendees join late. To enhance everybody's Zoom experience, please ensure that you keep your microphone muted and that you turn off your video for the duration of the presentation. It's also a great idea to minimize your Zoom gallery so that you can view the slides as best as possible. Thanks. So this seminar is currently being recorded on Zoom and it will be available to access along with past webinar videos via the website. You can click on the resources tab. These videos are usually uploaded one to two weeks after each seminar. Questions for the seminar will be aided by the use of Slido. You can log in anonymously or with your name and ask a question there. Our event code is aphasia CRE. Enter your question under the questions tab at any time throughout the presentation. You'll also be able to see the questions asked by other audience members. You can like a question by ticking um, or clicking on the thumbs up to show those questions that are of most interest. Um, now, Professor Sakamo will answer as many questions as time will allow at the end of the presentation. And we also welcome your um, suggestions for future seminar topics in the polls tab. Please also engage with us on social media via Twitter and Facebook. You can tweet along today using the hashtag aphasiacre. Lastly, if you haven't already done so, please join us as a member of the Aphasia CRE. We welcome people with aphasia, their family, friends, health professionals, researchers and organisations to our Aphasia CRE community of practice. Benefits to members of the COP or community of practice include a regular newsletter, updates about events and activities, contributions to research, networking opportunities, and more. Finally, the CRE is always looking for financial support. And if you wish to donate, please see our website for details. So now, I'm delighted to formally introduce Associate Professor Teppo Sarkamo. Teppo is an Associate Professor of Neuropsychology at the Cognitive Brain Research Institute at the University of Helsinki. Teppo's main research interest is on the neural mechanisms of music and speech perception and their deficits. So amusia and aphasia, aging, neuroplasticity of auditory and cognitive functions, and the clinical use of music-based interventions in neurological diseases, such as stroke, traumatic brain injury, and dementia. Teppo's research team is called the Music, Aging and Rehabilitation Team, or MART. They use a combination of research methods from cognitive neuroscience, clinical neuropsychology and psychology to focus specifically on the impact of music and speech on the recovery and perseveration, or sorry, preservation of cognitive, auditory and motor functions in the aging brain, as well as on emotions, mood and psychological well-being. Dr. Sarkamo has been awarded the Cortex Prize of the Federation of the European Societies of Neuropsychology and an ERC starting grant. We're so grateful to have you here, Tefo. Thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you, Michelle, uh, for the kind introduction. I will just take a moment to start sharing my screen now. So I hope you can all see the slides clearly. 
So good morning to you all. It's eight o'clock here in Helsinki and much later to you to in the Australia. Uh, so thank you very much for this invitation. So it's a great pleasure to give this talk. So uh, Michelle already I kindly introduced where I come from. So our unit is called the Cognitive Brain Research Unit. We are located at the uh, Faculty of Medicine here at University of Helsinki. And here, uh, as Michelle said, I'm leading a team called Music, Aging and Rehabilitation Team. So we're about 15 researchers uh, working quite kind of interdisciplinarily uh, doing research, mostly on using neuropsychological measures, but also quite heavily using neuroimaging uh, to study both these uh, phenomena related to the preservation or deficits of different musical skills, such as music perception and singing in different neurological conditions, and also trying to pioneer the use of these different types of music interventions for, for neurological populations. So uh, in today's talk, uh, there's I will just give you a brief out outline. So we will go through kind of four topics here. First, an introduction into the neuroscience of music, quite briefly, just to go through uh, some of the basic uh, neuroanatomy, if you like, about the processing of music in the healthy brain. And then we will talk about amusias, so these music-related uh, deficits caused by other abnormal development or damage to the brain. Uh, then we will shift towards talking about aphasia, about preservation of musical abilities in aphasia, a bit about our own studies on uh, the use of songs as a learning tool also for aphasia. And then finally, turning to the music-based rehabilitation of stroke and aphasia in the last part of the talk. So, uh, okay, about the processing of music in the healthy brain. Just a second, yeah. So this is something that has been studied in, in the field of cognitive neuroscience of music for the last 10 to 20 years. And I think there's a, quite a lot of consensus now about how music is processed in the brain. And this is just a brief overview of which different areas and networks we're actually using when we are engaging with music. So first of all, music is of course a form of sound. So the ascending auditory pathway all the way from the inner ear to the inferior colliculus auditory parts of the thalamus and then to the auditory cortex. So this system uh, uh, is responsible for the perception of these different basic acoustic features of any sounds, including music. So analyzing pitch, duration, uh, intensity, and those kinds of lower level auditory features. And these are the features that we, of course, share with speech as well. Uh, but then again, of course, music is much more than just these individual sounds. So the way they are put together to form these more musical constructs, such as melodies, harmony, interval structures, and so on. Uh, the perception of these higher order musical features is governed by a more extensive cortical network. So from the auditory cortex, uh, this information is then transferred to the posterior parts of the uh, temporal, superior temporal gyrus, and also the inferior uh, or the anterior parts, as well as parts of the parietal lobe, the premotor cortex, inferior parts of the frontal cortex, as well as the medial prefrontal cortex. And this system is sort of the cognitive analysis system for music. It enables you to perceive what you hear really as music. Uh, and music is something that always unfolds over time. So as a glue to sort of uh, put all of this information together in the temporal con context, we need our attention and working memory systems. So these specific regions in the inferior parietal lobe, inferior frontal gyrus, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, as well as the anterior parts of the single edge gyrus are heavily involved in this type of processing. Um, we often like hearing music that is familiar to us. So actually the familiarity aspect of music plays a crucial role also for the emotional impact of music. And whenever we hear a song that we know we've heard before, it sort of automatically triggers quite a lot of episodic or autobiographical memories. And this is something that's really crucial, for example, for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but all in all, music is closely linked to the episodic and also the semantic memory system of the brain. So these specific regions such as the hippocampus, the precuneus, the angular gyrus, parts of the temporal and frontal cortex as well, are quite closely in, associated with the processing of music. But music is also movement. So the rhythm of music uh, is, a, is a key feature. So we have a natural tendency as humans to entrain our movement to the steady beat of music. And also 
when I, whenever we just hear music, actually, we are actually engaging quite a lot of these motor systems in the brain as well. Uh, so regions such as the motor parts of the striatum or the basal ganglia, the motor and the premotor cortex, the somatosensory cortex and parts of the cerebellum are linked to this. And of course, when we are engaging with music actively, we are dancing to it or even just tapping to the rhythm, uh, playing a musical instrument, singing. We're of course using this system much more extensively. Uh, the neurobasis of singing is something that has been also studied using fMRI, for example. And there are some pioneering studies that have already compared uh, the singing production to speech production, kind of mapping these regions that govern uh, the difference also between singing and, and speaking. Uh, there is one study, for example, here by Boris Kleber and others, which showed that the overproduction of sung phrases activates these highly bilateral regions, uh, both in the superior temporal gyrus, as well as in the primary motor cortical and some of the sensory areas, as well as the cerebellum. So the bilaterality is the sort of the key word here. We know that singing engages the both uh, hemisphere networks quite extensively. And this is, of course, a crucial issue when we talk about the use of singing in aphasia rehabilitation as well. Uh, interestingly, in this study, they, also, they were also able to show that the amount of singing practice that the subjects had who participated in the scanning study was directly linked to the activity uh, of the uh, some of the sensory cortex, especially the representation areas for the larynx and the articulatory system, and also for the dorsal the prefrontal cortex and the angular gyrus. And then finally, there's of course the emotional aspect of music. So music is a strong driver of, of vivid emotions, as we know, and it engages heavily this reward and emotion processing network. So these regions starting from the ventral tegmental area all the way to the amygdala, the orbitofrontal cortex, the insula, the thalamus, the, especially the nucleus accumbens part of the basal ganglia and the medial prefrontal cortex as well. So this is of course what we know to be the reward system of the brain. And it has been one of the key findings in the neuroscience of music to show how extensively musical walked emotions actually engage this, uh, this uh, me mesolimbic system, this dopamine based system to derive, to bring us sort of the, the pleasurable experience and the rewarding aspect of music when we are engaging with it. Okay. So this is, of course, what happens in the healthy brain. But another way to study, of course, the neural basis of music is to look towards uh, these neurological deficits in the processing of music. And this is something that has been done, done in the field of amusia studies. So amusia, by definition, is a, a severe deficit in music perception or production uh, caused either by an abnormal brain development, which is termed congenital amusia, or uh, by uh, usually a stroke or other form of uh, uh, brain damage, uh, which is usually called acquired amusia. Uh, I guess one of the key words here is that it, it's, it's a sort of a severe deficit. So uh, you have to distinguish between people's self-perceived lack of musical ability that is quite, quite common among us. So we often downplay our own musicality in many ways. But even among people who feel themselves to be you know, less musical, I think studies show that around 17% of them actually test as A music when, when this is assessed with formal batteries. So A music can impair the perception of one or more musical features. features. Usually the, the, the hallmark deficit in A music is the ability to, uh, uh, the, or the inability to detect small pitch changes within melodies, less than one semitone, for example. But also other features such as the timbre of music, the rhythm, and also music walked emotions, or the perception of emotions that music reflects might be impaired, or the recognition of music as well. And there are some various perceptual tests out there that have been developed for the clinical analysis or and diagnosis of amusia. One of the most widely known is called the Montreal Battery of Evaluation of Amusia, or MBEA. So the idea here is that you hear consecutive short melodies played usually with a piano. And then you just have to say whether they sound the same or not. And in some of the trials, the second melody has an alteration, a musical alteration, uh, such as, for example, in this example. So this 
I don't know how this sound came across, but you, you may have heard a slight uh, change in the second part in one, one specific note that was slightly higher than in the original melody. Oh, then the distorted tunes test that sounds like this. So you may have heard that the last part of this national anthem of US sounded slightly off. So the idea is to detect these, these off parts uh, within these melodies. So here are a couple of uh, uh, well-known uh, specimens <laughs> of a musia. So Che Guevara was said to be entirely rhythm deaf. So the difficulties in actually perceiving or differentiating between different uh, genres of dance, for example. And then Theodore or Ulysses Grant uh, was another one who was said to be entirely tone deaf. And there's one classic anecdote saying that I know only two tunes. One of them is Yankee Doodle and the other isn't. So apparently Grant was really able to just identify songs based on their lyrics and not, not much with their melody. But overall, congenital amusia uh, occurs approximately in 1.5% of the general population. And this acquired form of amusia caused by a lesion is a bit more common. So our own studies and other studies suggest that uh, in the acute stage, so within the first weeks, for example, after, after a middle cerebral artery stroke, if you would test uh, uh, stroke patients, especially with a temporal lobe lesion or a frontal parietal lesion, um, the majority of them would actually show some level of deficits uh, in these tests. Whether that's just purely due to the musical deficit or some other cognitive deficits that make it more difficult is, of course, another question. But, but some level of musical perception difficulties quite, can be quite common after stroke. Uh, and about a third of the patients may test uh, a music in the chronic stage, three to six months or one year after a stroke. The neural basis of congenital amusia has been something that's been quite extensively studied using uh, a collection of different structural and functional neuroimaging methods. And I guess the current consensus in the field already is that it's sort of a disconnection syndrome uh, in these frontotemporal pathways, especially in the right hemisphere. So the primary auditory cortex in a congenitally a music person seems to be working okay. So it can perceive uh, these musical features, uh, but this information transfer then to the inferior frontal gyrus via these white matter tracts such as the arcuate fasciculus uh, does not occur. So there's a deficit in this. And, and, and there have been structural anomalies found both in the arcuate fasciculus and also in the inferior frontal gyrus in congenital amusia. Uh, in addition to having these uh, deficits in music perception, it's interesting to note that some congenital amusics can also have fine grain deficits in in more ling linguistic features. So the perception of both linguistic and emotional prosody in speech. So for example, if uh, a music person are asked to discriminate these sentences, for example, like this. She looks like Anne. She looks like Anne. The slightly higher uh, pitch intonation in the latter sentence would indicate it as a question. And a music person may have difficulties in actually differentiating this question statement pairs. Or then for the emotional prosody connotation of speech, for example, a happy speech sample that sounds like this. The girl and boy walk to the fridge to fetch some milk for lunch. Uh, so the music persons may not be able to perceive this as happy or but the same goes also for the other emotions. So these fine grained uh, deficits that rely on, on the processing of pitch information in speech may be impaired also in amusia. The neural basis for acquired amusia is something that has been, of course, a bit more complex. So this is just a quick overview of all the different studies starting from the 60s that have looked at either individual cases or then small samples of patients and, and mapping sort of where the lesions have been reported in the papers. So this is a jumbled up picture. And of course, that's, that's the point of it. So it's our, our understanding previously of the neural basis of acquired amusia has been really poor. So basically lesions of all types of different locations have been associated with amusia, but most prominently in the right hemisphere and most prominently in, in parts of the temporal cortex. But beyond that, we really don't have a kind of a clear understanding of which specific areas have been linked to acquired amusia. 
So this is something that has been a focus of our own study. So I will present our own uh, uh, post-stroke amusia studies now. So in two parallel studies, we collected the sample of altogether 90 stroke patients from two cities in, in Finland, Helsinki and Turku, and as a part of a music intervention trial. So these patients performed the scale and the rhythm subtests of the MBA battery, and also uh, they underwent structural and functional MRI three, three times at the acute three month and, and six month post-stroke stages. So using voxel-based lesion symptom mapping, we were able to show that amusia was linked specifically to lesions in these areas that you can see here. So especially the right superior and middle temporal gyrus, the insula, the inferior frontal gyrus, the striatum, and the hippocampus. So these regions seem to form sort of the core lesion pattern underlying amusia. Uh, over the six month follow up, we were able to see which of the patients actually recovered and which did not. And looking at those who recovered versus those who didn't, we were able to also show that those ones who have a persistent for non recovering form of amusia had lesions, especially in the right SDG insula and the IFG. So this more limited pattern that was quite common and, and, some, and, and also quite, quite the same that we also saw for congenital amusia in the, in the previous slides as well. Uh, over time, there was also increased gray matter volume reduction or atrophy in, in those areas that were initially not lesioned, uh, but lack of poor lack of recovery then also uh, led to further atrophy or vice versa in these regions, in specifically again in the right temporal areas and the insula and the IFG as well. We also included diffusion tensor imaging to look at white matter tracks uh, that were linked to the presence of AMUSA. And using deterministic tractography, we were able to show that these non-recovered amusics had reduced white matter volume specifically in these key frontal temporal tracts, such as the arcuate fasciculus, uh, the uncinate, and also the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus. So these shorter and longer tracts that connect different parts of the temporal and the frontal cortex were typically impaired in amusia. Over time, we also saw some additional degenerative changes in white matter, such as higher mean diffusivity or radial diffusivity uh, in these same tracks over time. There were some uh, specific tracks that were associated with the pitch form of amusia and the rhythm form of amusia. So specifically, we saw that the posterior part of the corpus callosum known as the tapetum that connects the left and the right temporal cortex and the auditory regions together that showed more degeneration in the pitch form of amusia, whereas the rhythm of amusia was more linked to uh, decreasing volume of these bilateral frontal tracts, the uncinate and also the frontal aslant tract as well. Uh, we also had an fMRI part in this study where we uh, had the patients uh, undergo an MRI scan and just during the scan we presented them with uh, some vocal or some uh, auditory stimuli. So that those included vocal music, so singing, and then also sort of karaoke versions of the vocal songs without the lyrics, so just the instrumental instrumental versions of the songs, and also poems uh, as, a, as a kind of a language control. And we, of course, then compared the A-musics and the non-A-musics also in this regard, and we found that uh, the A-musics actually showed reduced activation specifically to instrumental music. And this was seen in, in quite large extensive regions in bilateral frontal cortex and also uh, specifically in left temporal areas. Uh, well, basically across time, but more and more, more significantly at the three month post-stroke stage. Uh, those A-musics that recovered over time showed increased activation over time to instrumental music um, in some parts of the bilateral frontal and parietal regions. So these are, I guess, part of the attention network suggesting that they were able to pay more attention to uh, the instrumental music over time. But interestingly, uh, the music also showed increased activation to vocal music, uh, again in these quite extensive bilateral regions in the frontal cortex, also the right temporal and parietal regions at specific time points. And, and this suggests that, that this preservation of, of the processing of vocal music is something that could be quite useful, for example, when we think about the rehabilitation of post-stroke in musia, for example, using singing as a tool for that. 
So um, Alexis Sihbonen, who's the lead uh, author in this these sets of studies, uh, proposed this sort of a simple kind of a dual stream model for acquired amusia recovery that kind of focuses on the ventral and the dorsal tracks. So very simply, so if you have extensive damage that sort of cuts both the frontal, uh, both the ventral and the dorsal pathways, so including the acquired fasciculus and the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, then recovery from a musia after stroke seems unlikely. Whereas if one of the tracks remains preserved, uh, usually perhaps the, the dorsal tract, then recovery is possible because there is a lot some shared functionality between the dorsal and the ventral streams as we know. Okay, uh, then about the preservation of musical abilities in a patient. And to kind of illustrate this uh, phenomenon that may of course be familiar to many of you, here's a short clip and this actually comes from Australia. Some days she can speak a little, others she's lost for words completely. And some days she can write more than speak, but she may never return to full conversation ability again. Does it feel for you like you're trapped in your mind in some way, sometimes? But something incredible happened that's about to turn Emma's life around, what her parents call a miracle. One day we just, my husband just said, let's put some music on, you know, she might respond to music. And all of a sudden the song I Will Survive came on and she started singing it. You're not I, I will survive. Oh, as long as I know how to love, I know I still love. And we just looked so stunned, we couldn't believe. She could sing that song, but she couldn't tell me my name. So that was Emma. So this um, may seem familiar. So the preservation of, of singing ability, especially for familiar songs, is something that can often happen in aphasia. But there's surprisingly little kind of scientific studies about this. Uh, what we know is that, based on literature, is that stroke patients with aphasia sometimes do show preserved singing related abilities, especially for the better repetition of words of familiar songs through singing and, and speech, and also the better completion of phrases of familiar songs through singing than speech, and also some ability to sing spontaneously with or without lyrics. Uh, why this happens in the brain is something that has, has not been really, really mapped. Uh, to, uh, but uh, we're actually working on this, this in, in our own study at the moment. So this is, this is really just work ongoing at the moment. So some first results, some preliminary results that we get from, from this use of voxel based lesion symptom mapping in a sample of chronic aphasic patients. So we here have 30 basic patients who are asked to perform a spontaneous speech task, this classic picture description task on the Western aphasia battery, and also some spontaneous singing, for example, just either with cued or uncued uh, versions, sing lyrics for Brother John, which is this classic children's song that might be familiar to you. So here's a sample from one of our Finnish aphasic patients trying to do this uh, picture description task first. Yeah. <laughs> and that goes on. So she has quite severe anomia, uh, able to just produce individual words as the word boo, which means tree in Finnish, as you can see in this picture. But then for the rest of this task, not much the words comes out. And this is the same lady uh, singing just spontaneously from her memory, the lyrics to Jaakko Kult. Basically, she gets the whole song. So again, this quite strong distinction of uh, how well singing and, and speech production can can kind of dissociate in some of basic patients. And the results that we're seeing at the moment is that, not surprisingly, uh, using voxel based lesion symptom mapping, this spore. Uh, spontaneous speech production was linked to lesions specifically in these key aphasia regions 
uh, in the anterior and tem temporal lobe, and also in frontal regions, including the Broca's region as well. But interestingly, those aphasic patients who also had deficits in, in singing or were not able to really produce this uh, Brother John song, they seem to have lesions that extended more towards the posterior temporal regions and also the parietal regions. So the lesion patterns underlying, underlying these seem to be quite different. So this is, as I said, this is still study ongoing. So once we get more patients and, and do more analysis, it will hopefully reveal more about this. And also to look at the regions that are uh, preserved uh, using voxel based pomology, pomology, for example. We're also doing uh, in a parallel study using fMRI. We're looking into the, the activation patterns underlying the preservation of singing production in aphasia. So the task is quite simple. So we are uh, actually teaching them a set of new songs that they're training in a, in a choir during the intervention part of this study. Uh, but we are presenting these same songs then uh, in an fMRI scanning situation where they just hear kind of short phrases, uh, a couple of bars at a time of this novel song that they first have to listen to, and then they have to sing along, and then they have to immediately sing from memory what they just uh, sang previously. Uh, so phrases like this. So this is a novel song, something that they haven't, haven't heard before. And what we're seeing is that uh, specifically this listening condition compared to a rest baseline activates the superior temporal lobe, especially the, in the right hemisphere. The singing along addition uh, then also brings into play these sensory motor cortical regions again more in the right hemisphere. And then the singing from memory in aphasic patients also activates the left inferior frontal and insular regions and also the anterior cingulate and supplementary motor area. So what sort of builds into is a more kind of cognitively complex uh, processing of these songs, which by the way, the aphasic patients seem to be able to do quite well in the scanner as well. So this is still something that we're collecting more data for. Another question that is interesting is, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, is, is whether songs themselves could be also used as a tool for verbal learning and memory. And some background here. So, of course, one of the key cultural functions of songs was it was uh, uh, to pass on verbal knowledge between generations. And musical mnemonics is a term that refers to these aspects. So, music, especially singing, can act as a learning aid that provides a sort of a structural temporal scaffolding framework that can facilitate the learning of new words. Uh, and in songs, we know uh, from neuroimaging literature that the neural processing of lyrics and tunes seem to be quite closely integrated across different frontotemporal regions, especially in the left hemisphere. So there is some indication that we, we're actually processing uh, the, the melodic information and the lyrical information sort of as a whole in the brain, at least at some uh, processing stages. Um, there are some studies in healthy subjects suggest that novel verbal materials such as word lists or stories is really learned and recalled better when presented in a sung format than, than in a spoken format. Whereas there is also studies that have failed to find this effect, uh, typically when, when the presentation rate is controlled for. So of course, singing tends to be slower than, than speech production. And this may be one of the features that, that is related to this effect as well. Uh, some clinical studies have found this effect also in multiple sclerosis patients. Uh, Alzheimer's disease patients seem to be able to recall unfamiliar songs better when they are presented in sung than spoken format. And a couple of studies show that aphasic stroke patients also can repeat words and complete the ends of familiar songs better when they are presented in sung than in spoken format. Whereas also some studies have found no uh, advantage of song presentation in the learning of, of unfamiliar lyrics. Uh, but we aim to test this also in our own uh, study to determine whether songs could have a mnemonic effect of the stroke for the learning and recall of novel narrative stories that haven't really been used in these types of studies before that are presented either in sung and spoken formats and to see whether aphasic and non-aphasic patients show a different pattern of these effects and to also test whether different effects can be seen at the acute post-stroke stage as opposed to the more chronic six-month follow-up stage. We also aim to explore the memory processes contributing to this mnemonic effect of songs, looking into serial position effects and chunking effects. I will go through this quickly. 
and then also uncover the structural neural correlates of these effects using voxel-based formometry and uh, diffusion tensor image. So we, for this purpose, we designed our own task, which is called the Sung Spoken Story Recall task. So we all together developed four different stories, each containing five verses and approximately 50 to 60 words, uh, describing some kind of an unexpected novel event in real life. So we had both spoken versions of these stories uh, recorded with a natural prosody. That... Kaivopuiston kohdalla Seppo huomasi, että puhelin oli kadonnut farkkujen taskusta. So there's some finish for you. Uh, so this is a story about a, a person losing his cell phone and then uh, the events that sort of unfold after this, this, this thing. And, but then we also had sung versions of each of these stories. And we tried to sort of build a really simple and repetitive melody that was, you know, across all of the verses of the song. And the, that version would sound like this one. Kaivopuiston kohdalla Seppo huomasi, että puhelin oli kadonnut farkkujen taskusta. Some learning trials, delayed recall trial, and then altogether 30 patients, 14 with aphasia, were completing this study. And what we found was that at the acute post-stroke stage, there was really no difference between the learning and recall of the spoken and sung versions of the story. So it gets better, but no difference between the tasks. Whereas at the six-month stage, there actually was. So um, these sung stories were learned, re learned better, starting from the second and the third learning trial, and also recalled better afterwards as well. And in the brain, this was linked specifically uh, to uh, the gray matter volume in the right anterior temporal regions, the SDG and the MDG here, and also to the uh, white matter volume and fractional isotropy of the right antenate that is connecting this part to the frontal cortex. And interestingly, these effects actually were seen uh, in those patients who at the acute stage were tested as aphasic. But at the six month stage, of course, they still had minor or residual aphasia. But still, these learning effects seem to be more prominent among the aphasic subgroup. And in the aphasic patients, this was linked specifically, uh, this better recall of the Sangan learning st learn spoken stories, specifically to, for example, the left uh, frontal regions, starting from the inferior frontal gyrus all the way to the motor cortex. And also some uh, white matter pathways were specifically linked to this in aphasia, especially the left frontal Aslan tract that is connecting these regions here, as well as the antenate and the arcuate vesiculus on the right side. About the mechanisms <clears throat> of these effects. So one thing that we looked into was serial position effects. So this is the classic sort of memory related phenomenon when <clears throat> Whenever we hear a material that is beyond the capacity of the working memory to process, we tend to recall most of it from the first or the early parts of the material and the last parts of the material, whereas the middle parts tends to be uh, recalled more poorly. And what we found was that in non-aphasic patients, they actually uh, showed no serial precision effects for the sung uh, stories. So they were the melody sort of helped them to recall, especially the middle parts of the stories better in the sun condition compared to the spoken condition, where there was a, was a clear uh, pattern of serial position effects. And this lack of serial position effects was actually linked to, uh, in the non aphasic patients, to the structural of the left arcuate fasciculus. Interestingly, the aphasic patients showed an enhanced recency effect for the sung material, so they were able to call the last parts of the sung stories much better than the for the spoken stories. And this in turn was linked uh, to the structure of the right uh, ventral tract, the, the IFOF that we can see here. Uh, we also looked at chunking. So chunking is, is a term where, which is used to denote how long kind of memory units we are able to recall from any material. So the longer chunks, the more words that are recalled consecutively. <clears throat> Yeah, as a sort of an indicator of this effect. So we found that, especially for the aphasic patients, that they, they did recall longer chunks, uh, specifically in the sun compared to the spoken task. And we also were interested in seeing whether these phenomena are linked to their emotional prosody, uh, perception ability. So for this purpose, we also had this another task that the patients were doing where they have to identify the emotional prosody of 
these individual stimuli that sound, for example, like this. Sara. Neutral. Sara. Fearful. Sara. Sad. Sara. Happy. Sara. Angry. Sara. Or surprised. And interestingly, there was a really high correlation between performance for this emotional processing task and the length of the chunks that they were recalling specifically in the sung task. So it seems that these phenomena are quite heavily linked. Okay, now we turn to the last phase, which is about music-based rehabilitation. So some quick points about why to use music in rehabilitation. So you saw this, some of these slides first. Uh, so of course, the actual kind of widespread nature of the, the music processing system in the brain, the fact that we don't have a specific center for processing music, but that the processing of music is, is kind of wide, really widespread in the brain across the both the left and the right hemispheres as well, leads to kind of increased cerebral blood flow, of course, in these regions. And when we talk about post, the post-stroke uh, recovery and the role of neuroplasticity in that recovery, uh, this could be what's, what's sort of driving the effects of music uh, as well. So this environmental enrichment uh, explanation sort of. And also this emotional effect of music, the fact that it's able to engage this, these dopamine uh, pathways in the mesolimbic reward system could be something that's really driving the uh, rehabilitative efficacy of music. And finally, there's also the sort of the relaxing side of music that helps to relax and reduce stress. And this is sort of mediated by two systems, the autonomic nervous system, so we see changes to music as, as physiological reactions, for example, in breathing rate or heart rate, or then the, the stress mediation system, the HPA axis that, that underlies the secretion of cortisol, for example. And we, we know that relaxing music can reduce cortisol levels and therefore reduce stress. So this could be one mechanism, mechanisms. But also then, of course, the fact that music provides an enjoyable and meaningful leisure activity that is kind of well suited also to the hospital environment. And we know that, yeah, even in rehab centers, stroke patients typically don't get enough activity that they should be getting for the purpose of brain plasticity. Uh, so most of the time is actually spent alone and inactive, lying in bed, unfortunately. And for example, the stroke lines for Europe in their report have also stated the same thing, saying that rehabilitation is typically not intense enough and it's too short and often fails to address some key issues such as depression, but also cognitive deficits as well. And music really plays a crucial role for this type of rehabilitation. And music-based rehabilitation for stroke has been out there for, for some decades now. Uh, most of the evidence is still not that strong uh, due to the lack of study, uh, properly controlled studies in this field. But for some methods, there is also already a moderate level of evidence based on these Cochrane reviews that have looked into the overall efficacy of these interventions. One of them is rhythmic auditory stimulation. So the RAS training that uses the steady beat or rhythm of music to train uh, gait or hemiparetic arm movements at the stroke. And this seems to be effective. So the addition of the musical rhythm to physical therapy training can be really beneficial. But then again, there are, of course, other methods, uh, for example, music-supported training or MST training uh, that uses musical instruments such as keyboard and drums to improve motor control of the arm and also lead to some uh, neuroplasticity changes in the auditory and motor coupling between the specific uh, brain regions. Some indications that patients with, with the neglect syndrome also benefit from playing musical tone sequences or scales from left to right. Uh, this can uh, apparently temporarily alleviate the spatial attention bias that is at the core of the neglect uh, phenomenon. Melodic intonation therapy is, of course, uh, the, uh, the classic uh, use of music in stroke rehabilitation. I'm not going to talk about melodic intonation therapy today more, uh, but, but as you may know, so it's the singing-based uh, rehabilitation method for aphasia that has been found in some case studies and also some randomized controlled trials to improve spontaneous speech production and articulation and naming abilities as well in aphasic patients and also to enhance the activity and connectivity specifically of this right frontotemporal uh, speech production uh, system. And also there's this classic use of music therapy as a way to improve mood and quality of life and also increase social participation and, and interaction. 
But in addition to that, uh, we were interested in our set of studies to see whether also daily music listening as a leisure activity could be beneficial for cognitive recovery emotionally uh, and also for neuroplasticity after stroke. So for this purpose, we designed a set of studies. The first one was performed already a while ago. Uh, so this was a three-arm parallel randomized controlled trial with a six-month follow-up that was performed in Helsinki uh, with 60 patients in this first trial. As outcome measures, we used neuropsychological tests and then uh, magnetoencephalography and um, MRI as well. Randomization into three groups, one involving music listening, one audiobook listening, and then a standard care control group. And the idea here was that the patients were giving this material to listen to that consisted either of their own favorite music or then audiobooks that were self-selected as well. And yes, they, they were instructed to do this at a daily basis, at least for one hour per day. And then we followed them up uh, three months and six months after the stroke. And the initial results that we got were really positive. So we found that uh, in the cognitive domain, both verbal memory and attention recovery improved more in the music listening group compared to the audiobook and the control groups. And these effects were also maintained after longitudinal six month follow up. And also emotionally, the music listening group patients felt that uh, the intervention helped them to, uh, or they reported less depression and less confusion uh, than the control group here as well. Uh, using voxel based pompometry, we also looked at the structural changes that may be linked to these uh, effects. And we found that for the music listening group, gray matter volume actually increased more over the six month follow up in these specific uh, prefrontal cortical regions. And the increase in these cortical regions in, in their gray matter over time was correlated with the better recovery of verbal memory, language skills, and also focused attention in these patients. And additionally, there were also some effects on, on the limbic system as well. So again, the music listening group showed increased gray matter volume, specifically in the left ventral anterior cingulate and also the right ventral striatum. And these uh, uh, effects were then linked to the reduction of negative mood. So for example, the depression scores in the POMS scale, suggesting that this could be sort of the emotional neuroanatomical correlate for the effects of music of the stroke. But then the next question would be, uh, what is more most effective? So does the type of music matter? So we know from the imaging literature that vocal music, so, so music that contains the lyrics and the singing component, is processed more bilaterally in the brain compared to both normal speech production as well as to instrumental music. So the specific regions in temporal lobe and also frontal lobe are more involved in the processing of vocal music. And also some indication that these more limbic deep regions uh, that are linked to emotion and memory related processing, such as the amygdala and the hippocampus, seem to be more engaged by vocal music than instrumental music as well. And also in our study that uh, we also talked about in the context of the AMUSIA uh, research, but this is sort of the overall picture that we saw across patients in these fMRI tasks was that uh, at the acute post stroke stage, so two to three weeks after the stroke, uh, when the patients were listening to vocal music, we found that uh, actually these are the wrong way around. So this should be vocal music and this should be instrumental music. Uh, the ex ex activation patterns in these bilateral temporal, frontal and subcortical regions were much more extensive uh, in the vocal condition. So in this next study, that is the last one I'll present, we were asking this novel question of whether vocal music could be more effective than instrumental music or speech for enhancing cognitive and language recovery for the emotional aspects and also for the neuroplasticity aspects. And for this purpose, we ran a second trial uh, using a similar design uh, with a similar outcome measures, including both verbal memory, language, attention, and mood, as well as uh, these uh, structural functional MRI parts. Uh, but this time we had two different music groups. So vocal music group where they just listened to uh, music that had lyrics and singing component and the instrumental group, music group without the, the singing component in the music. And the same design otherwise, and then a follow up three and six months later on. And then we also, in order to kind of increase the statistical power in the study, we also ended up pooling these 
uh, results together with our first study. And in order to do this, we did some post hoc reallocation of this music intervention group to different arms based on what type of music they had listened to during the intervention period. So either vocal music or predominantly instrumental music. So with this pooling, then we finally ended up with 83 patients completing the whole trial uh, with roughly similar sample sizes in each group. And I will just, I know time is running out, so I will just quickly go through this. So essentially no significant differences in the groups at baseline, some great differences in music processing, but these were controlled as later in the analysis. The lesion patterns in the three groups seem to be quite nicely linked. And also the groups were comparable in terms of the other rehabilitation they received and the uh, adherence to the intervention protocol seemed to be working relatively okay. And the results then uh, was that for verbal memory, we actually found that vocal music listening group showed better recovery than the other two groups, both the instrumental music group and the audiobook group over the three month follow up and over the six month follow up as well. But interestingly, in addition to that, also the basic language skills, which were these tests measuring speech production and comprehension, improved more in the vocal than in the auditory uh, audio book group over the three month period. And this positive change in uh, positive uh, effect on, on language skill recovery was actually seen only in the aphasic subgroup of patients in whom uh, there was a clear distinction there over the first three months. As here as well. Uh, regarding the emotional effects, there were no significant effects here, unfortunately. Uh, but turning to the neuroplasticity side, so we again do it in voxel-based performatory analysis to look at gray matter volume. And what we found was that specifically in these left temporal uh, lobe clusters, uh, gray matter volume increased more in the vocal music group than in the audiobook group over the six month stage. And some additional effects also in the white matter volume in the phasic patients in whom the vocal music group uh, showed increased uh, white matter volume than the audiobook group, specifically in these uh, uh, kind of medial parietal occipital areas, such as the cuneus and the precuneus as well. And this was linked to better language recovery. Finally, for the last results, we also looked at the functional neuroplasticity, especially functional connectivity of one of the key networks in the brain, the default mode network. And this was done both in a resting state condition and also during uh, this uh, listening to vocal and the instrumental music. And what we found was that uh, in the resting state condition, there was increased functional connectivity between these left temporal regions and the rest of the default mode network that is shown in red in this image. And this was yes, yeah, larger in the vocal music group again than in the other groups and linked also to enhanced uh, verbal memory recovery. But also interestingly, during the condition when in the fMRI they were listening to vocal music, the whole network level connectivity within the default mode network increased more in the vocal music group compared to the audio group, suggesting that there was sort of material specific effects uh, happening as well. So a quick summary and conclusions from these uh, last findings is that music tends to be a rewarding, enriching and versatile stimulus that can be also effectively used in stroke and aphasia rehabilitation. And based on our own studies, it seems that daily music listening after the first, uh, during the first post-stroke months can be beneficial for improving recovery of verbal memory and attention, decreasing negative moods such as depression and confusion, and also inducing structural neuroplasticity uh, in these frontal limbic regions. Uh, especially vocal music can improve the recovery of verbal memory. And also, um, and this is the interesting part, and the novel result here is that it may enhance language recovery in aphasic patients as well, uh, suggesting that just having you know, vocal music to listen to could actually be a useful rehabilitation tool, especially in the early stages of aphasia rehabilitation, when active speech therapy is not often possible to arrange yet, either due to lack of resources or due to the severity of the aphasia. And then also these structural and functional neuroplasticity changes in left temporal regions and the default mode network were observed for specifically for vocal music. So that was basically all. Uh, so I would just like to show who were the people behind these studies and also thank you all for your attention. Wow, thank you so much, um, Tefo. We'll just have Car um, Kelly, our center manager, 
popping on the Slido questions. What an enormous body of work you represent there. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry I realized that this, the body was a bit, a bit too large at this time. So sorry for going <laughs> over time as this one. No problem. We have uh, about five minutes to go. And um, perhaps are you happy to see how we go with answering these questions during that time and, and uh, yeah. um, take it from there? All right, thank you. The first one is the impact of amusia on detecting speech prosody is so interesting. Could this be part of the presentation of pragmatic deficits that we see in people with acquired brain injury like traumatic brain injury? Yeah, it's, it's possible, definitely. So uh, this social communicative side of this, this issue is often neglected. So, and of course, we, didn't, we don't really assess amusia clinically. So it's, it's quite possible that many patients with more extensive lesions after a stroke or TBI may have a degree of prosodic difficulties and coupled also together with music perception difficulties that may make uh, uh, kind of life difficult in everyday situations where these kind of you know, fine-grained social cues are embedded in the speech context and they're able, not able to perhaps sometimes perceive them. So yeah, it's, it's likely. Yeah, a lot more insidious than we might have originally thought. Um, a question from James is, I'm a music therapy postgraduate student preparing to introduce a new therapy program under speech pathology in a neuro rehabilitation hospital. What is the role of music therapy in delivering these sorts of interventions as part of a health team, do you think? Hmm. I don't know. I guess this sort of depends a lot on the therapist and, and, and on the unit. So I, I've seen a lot of practices on how well music therapists are sort of incorporated within the rehabilitation teams. Uh, but, but of course, the music therapy itself is a, is a sort of an independent branch and these professionals work on their own terms and do their own types of interventions somehow sometimes. But, but, but for this more collaborative effort, I would see that music therapy, especially when applied in the context, for example, of ongoing physical therapy. So as with rhythmic auditory stimulation, as I talked about, where you just introduce the musical elements to the normal gait training, for example, or then introduce the singing elements to speech therapy as another option. So especially, yeah, especially the, the collaboration between music therapists and occupational and physical therapists and speech therapists would be kind of crucial you know, to sort of broaden the scope of these interventions that can be provided. Mm -hmm. This question next from Chelsea might link to the earlier one a little. Given deficits perceiving linguistic and emotional prosody, pros <laughs> there we go, prosody in congenital amusics, when we assess these skills in patients post-stroke, so particularly with cognitive communication deficits, should we be asking people about their musicality pre-injury mm. as a baseline? Yeah, I think definitely. So uh, we weren't really not in our studies. We were not really able to see much links between the pre-stroke musical abilities. So we just mainly aim to control for these factors in our analysis. But but it of course it's possible that that have being really active before the stroke in having a musical hobby, a long-term musical hobby or training, could serve some kind of protective impact in terms of how how musical skills can then be impaired as a result uh, of an injury. But then again, of course, there's this other aspect to this. So of course we have a group of professional musicians who may get a stroke and who will lose their livelihood and, and, and in whom uh, this can really have a dramatic effect. And, and for them, it can be really, really kind of frustrating not being able to do what they used to do before. But, but for them also music-based rehabilitation then can be useful to some extent as well. Mm, yep. Um, we've got a query here. Would you say that music-based rehab is, is effective more on an individual basis or within a group? So we've mm. got lots of aphasia choirs around the world, for yeah, example. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. And we also have an aphasia choir study running in Helsinki at the moment as well. So I would, uh, the question of whether which is more effective, I don't know. So of course, melodic intonation therapy is, is an individual based rehabilitation method. And it's, it's really, it, it can be effective uh, for some patients, yes. But it's of course very time consuming and an elaborate uh, intervention. And of course, this, this social element of music that is sort of at the heart or, the, or at the core of our musical experience. So we, 
music originally developed as a social phenomenon to enhance, for example, group bonding and cohesion. And, and those types of aspects are often lost when we move to the individual level. So uh, I would say that, for example, choir singing could potentially have more broader benefits than just melodic intonation therapy, especially for the emotional well-being and the social participation mm, of a yeah. person. Certainly. Thank you. Would you agree that the evidence investigating the generalization to conversation um, post utilizing music in therapy uh, is limited and requires further research? Yeah, Sounds of like course. That's where we're heading. <laughs> yeah, so uh, all in all, all of the findings that I sort of presented today will require more research. So that's that's the reality. So of course, much of this evidence is, is very limited. And in terms of how well the outcome measures that we use in these trials really reflect the the, uh, the real world conversation ability is, is a matter of question. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got a question from our aphasia CRE director, Miranda Rose, who's a big fan of group karaoke. Um, what are the likely mechanisms underpinning improved language processing after music or singing therapy? Things like mnemonic mechanisms or cross-modal priming, associative learning perhaps? Mm. Mm. Well, yeah, uh, regarding the mnemonic effects, so that's what we kind of saw in our study comparing the effects of uh, how well sung and spoken stories are recalled. Uh, so to some extent, of course, there may be when we just listen to music, if it has, 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 the, has the singing component of the lyrics in it, it might be that it's sort of, even though we're not actively trying to sort of recall the material or we're not trying to learn it, it may be that it's sort of uh, kind of doing some, some level of, of working memory, training, verbal working memory training as we just normally process it. But there's not much kind of literature or, or studies on this at the moment. But of course, yeah, cross-modal priming and associative learning uh, could be some, some key aspects of these effects as well. But not much studies here, unfortunately. Mm. That'll be useful to, to build our, our understanding mm. of the time. Are there any clinical screening tools of music, language, singing that speech pathologists could use to gain a better understanding or help to guide therapy? Mm. Well, I think the, well, the MBA battery, the Montreal Battery of Evaluation of Amusia, is which is, I think it's freely available at the University of Montreal at the, the Brahms Rehabilitation Center there. So you can look it up. Uh, it is uh, kind of normed. So it has, has a, a set of uh, norms that go with the test. So it's a bit lengthy for a screening measure. If you run the whole test, it takes about an hour, an hour and a half. But, you know, having specific parts of that could be one kind of widely used tool. Uh, I think the yeah the singing part is, is of course uh, yeah that's that's sort of language specific then so of course you would need to turn to anything that's in English I don't know if there are any singing based tests that are widely available at the moment not to my knowledge at least but but yeah that's something that for example in Australia you really should think about developing uh, these types of measures as well and norming them to your own population if if there are no such norms yet. Okay, we're nearly yeah. at the end of our list. Um, we've got a couple of comments. Um, I like yeah. the concept of music intervention in rehab, um, that it can be so effective in providing stimulation and facilitating neuroplasticity potentiation. Um, yeah, and I comment in the chat, um, sad to hear the, the statistics of time spent alone. I think we can rethink how we have our patients participate in activities so that they, um, all activities they enjoy in acute and subacute settings. So yeah, there's a lot to be tapping into there, hey. Um, and lucky last, are there any findings about people who are bilingual and have a stroke? So should we present, be presenting vocal music mm. in both languages? Uh, I'm not aware of that much bilinguality studies in stroke and aphasia. Uh, the, I think this has been studied, but I just don't know much of those studies. Uh, in general, bilingualism has been associated with some kind of neuroprotective effects, mm. uh, uh, also in aging, for example. So it, it's likely that uh, that it might they may be sort of at an, a, some advantage when it comes to to recovery, also. Or at least uh, of their uh, language skills in both languages. Uh, I don't know how much role would it actually play. Of course, uh, 
it, it will be more sort of has a potentially a more widespread effect if, if we're talking about uh but i i well i don't know i guess neuro, the, the neural mechanisms you know presenting uh, or underlying the processing of, of music don't really depend on the language of course as long as mm. the person understands it but but if it sort of makes the music listening experience more variable and more enjoyable and you're able to sort of open people who are bilingual and, and have are following the musical cultures of both languages mm. then you have sort of favorites in both so mm. of course so I would sort of think about the individual first. So what kind of music is really important? And then perhaps yeah. also okay. for a basic patients, if they have more deficits in one of the languages, then perhaps mm. focus specifically on that language mm. for the music. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you so much. We'll wrap up our questions there. Um, what, a, what a wealth of knowledge you've shared with us today, Teppo. Um, and now I will just show us our... Um, Show everybody our lucky last slide. Here we go. All right. I, I do wonder, Teppo, whether um, your research team has um, checked out your own music processing skills <laughs> and singing <laughs> capacities, perhaps. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm not a musician by any standards, so I would fail in that, but <laughs> you don't really need to be one. Well, it, it, it sounds like you can you can turn retelling a story about losing a cell phone into into what might sound like folk music to the uh yeah. the lady, uh, <laughs> so that was very impressive <laughs> yeah well thank you so much um for your contribution to our seminar series tepo and thanks to our audience for your participation as well um, if you have a moment please provide feedback for future via the slido app under the polls tab and we look forward to hosting the next seminar a bit earlier in the month than usual um, next month. And it's on Thursday, November at two o'clock. And please do note this next seminar won't be recorded. We're very excited to have Professor Sandy Middleton, Director of the Nursing Research Institute of St Vincent's Health in Australia, being our presenter. And her talk is entitled Lessons Learned in Implementation Trials and How to Improve Implementation of High-Level Evidence in Healthcare Settings. Thank you, everybody. Take care, and we look forward to seeing you next month.